Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, let's start today's meeting, uh, which title is Driving Labor Transparency in the Thai Sugarcane Industry. This project brings together the partners USAID, Ferragoa Asia, and Winwork International. Um, a little uh, point on our agenda. So we will have uh, opening remarks um, by uh, Elizabeth Kalenda, Vulnerable Population Team Leader, USAID Regional Development Mission for Asia, uh, who is based in Bangkok. We will also have a few introduction words by Megan McBain, Chief of Party for the USAID Thailand Steep Project, also based in Bangkok. A little word about myself, I'm Juliette Alemani, Country Manager and Data Scientist here at Ferragoa Asia. And during this presentation, you will also hear people from our team, uh, Jami, Namfon and Pime, who have participated in this project and have been doing a lot of field trips. We will have a presentation, therefore, by Ferragoa Asia. Um, initially, we actually planned to do 20 minutes presentation and then going through the slides, we thought we needed more time to go a little bit more into the details. I will have 10 minutes for question and answer. And we plan to have a little interactive session, um, basically to um, ask for some suggestions uh, from the audience, but also to exchange contact in order to build partnership for potential next phases. Um, so I'll leave it to Elizabeth Kalenda to uh, introduce a little bit this project. Thank you so much, Juliet. Um, good afternoon, distinguished guests, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Callender, um, and I'm the Vulnerable Populations Team Leader at USAID um, RDMA here in Bangkok. I'm so pleased and honored to welcome you to this webinar, Driving Labor Transparency in the Thai Sugarcane Industry. Um, as we all know, trafficking in persons is a massive humanitarian and development challenge. It affects millions of people in our society. USAID support of counter trafficking and persons activities focuses on the 4P paradigm. Um, I'm sure you are, um, that this includes prevention of trafficking, the protection of victims and survivors, prosecution of traffickers, and partnerships among a variety of stakeholders, both public and private, um, for a strengthened response to uh, trafficking. USAID, USAID deems the protection and empowerment of trafficking survivors as a very high um, priority. Um, and this has evolved into um, our new CTIP policy. Um, due to the complex and difficult mission of countering trafficking in persons and the challenges of evolving methods used by traffickers, Leveraging technology is a groundbreaking solution to address trafficking in persons and to better protect vulnerable populations. In order to promote technological sustainability, USAID empowers local innovators to use technology safely to counter human trafficking. USAID supports innovative research and technology to learn the changing patterns of trafficking in persons unveil enabling factors that increase people's vulnerability and develop creative approaches to reduce the prevalence of trafficking. The USAID CTIP program here in Thailand, um, led by Megan McGain, McBain, supports the Regional Development Mission for Asia's regional strategy to strive for a resilient, inclusive, and secure Southeast Asia. Through engaging a broad range of institutions and actors, this regional strategy seeks to improve cross-border protection of vulnerable populations, harmonize the implementation of regional frameworks, and implement solutions to address trafficking risks um, across supply chains. Um, this is something that we tackle through our um, Asia CTIP program as well. Um, today, we look forward to learning how CTIP practitioners leverage technology to mitigate trafficking risks and protect at-risk populations from exploitative conditions in sugarcane supply chains. We hope that the discussions to get today will inspire all participants to engage with technology and pursue innovative approaches in counter-trafficking. Thank you very much for your participation today. I look forward to hearing a very fruitful discussion and continuing our constructive collaboration. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, I'll leave the floor to Megan. 
Thanks, Juliet. Um, I echo Elizabeth in welcoming everyone to the webinar on driving labor transparency in the Thai sugarcane. Well, my name is Megan McBain. I'm the chief of party for the Thailand Counter Trafficking in Persons project, and I'll just say a little bit about the project. Uh, we work directly with Farragora on uh, Verificate. You'll learn more about that within the webinar. We're a five-year project. We're running from September of 2017 to September of 2022, and we in three sectors in Thailand. We really target fishers on boats, construction workers, and agriculture. We also work in six provinces throughout Thailand in a multitude of local and other NGOs as partners. The objective of the project are threefold. One, we are looking to reduce the demands for trafficked labor. We also are looking at empowering the at-risk population to safeguard their rights. And once those two are, are done, we're also hoping to strengthen protection systems for TIP survivors. In 2018, the USAID Thailand Sea Tip Project undertook what we call a landscape assessment activity, where we looked at industries in Thailand and ways to work directly with private sector. This partnership with Farragora came out of this assessment, and since 2019, we have worked together on sugarcane throughout Thailand. The webinar you are joined is an overview of this partnership, looking at lessons learned and findings. And we hope you find it interesting and useful for your future work. Thank you, Juliet. Thank you, Megan. Um, I'm moving now to the webinar's objectives, which are pretty simple and you'll receive the email. So we want today to share the main findings, the main outcomes from this project regarding the working conditions in the sugarcane industry in Thailand. We want to share the challenges we faced and the learnings from the project implementation. As a latest part, we want to discuss with you and brainstorm potential next steps and potentially initiate collaborations for next phases. A little bit now on the project background. Um, some of you might not be familiar with the conditions in the Thai sugarcane industry. So a few bullet points to um, share with you this information. The bulk of the production in Thailand for sugarcane comes from smallholder farmers which means uh, many of them are actually not tech savvy, which makes it a little bit hard to collect information. We are facing scattered supply chains with the bulk of the production being produced by all these smallholder farmers that then sell the raw material, the sugar cane, to a certain number of mills and that then sell to the international buyers. It is complicated to track information. There is a lack of transparency within these supply chains. And there is also a lot of um, information that are missing on the social risks uh, that workers and farm owners are facing. An additional pain point is um, how many seasonal workers um, come within this industry between December and March, which is the harvesting season. And we face a lot of migrant workers coming who usually do not have any work agreement. They therefore do not have any protection. It's with this, this information and this background, Asia and our tool Verificate uh, to provide tech solution and expertise and USAID, USAID and Windwork International uh, provided the resources um, on this counter trafficking in person issues. Um, at Ferragora Asia, we already work with a certain number of private sectors. Uh, one of the things that is a little bit complicated is whenever we want to tackle social issues, um, many times private se sector are a little bit reluctant um, to actually engage enough in the project. So this is where this partnership with USAID and WinWalk was essential um, to really tackle these social issues. Some background about um, our technology solution, which will be required to understand uh, better what we're doing in this project when using Verificate. So Verificate already existed before uh, the LTP project, uh, used mainly to ensure um, sustainability within the, within the industries on the environmental production parts and a little bit on the social aspects as well. Uh, so we have a web and a mobile application that allows users to enter data, 
We then provide data analysis um, and we verify the alignment uh, of metrics with international standards. We also do um, live monitoring on environmental social production aspects and we drive improvement by um, conducting workshops and by providing trainings to the users that we engage. One of the main achievements that we uh, did at the beginning of the project, and that um, also was very important um, as a first step to build this whole project, uh, was to actually align the whole tool with um, social categories from an international standard, called Sucro. Uh, so we made sure to uh, build these categories and to align them with one Sucro so that we could use them um, as a step first uh, to engage meals, but also to make sure that we could cover all the categories within the social risk areas. In terms of project objectives, um, I would summarize them with two uh, simple points. First, we aimed at designing a technology solution that would support um, the improvement of a social uh, risk within the supply chain. We wanted to tackle these issues, uh, measure social performance, but also document any traffic in in-person issues. As a second objective, we wanted to engage the target users, which are meals staff, farm owners, but also farm workers, whether they are Thai or migrant workers, and ensure that we co-create the tools with them um, and do something that would be useful to tackle the issues. Now, a little bit about how exactly we've been using Verificate tool within this project. In terms of general methodology, um, one of the first steps was, uh, of course, the outreach to meals, uh, which was on this in the challenges part, um, but we needed the buy-in from meals and from farm owners uh, to participate in the project. We did a lot of focus group discussions to engage them in the methodology creation as well and make sure they understood well uh, what we were doing there. We designed social surveys, but also technology adoption surveys. Um, there have been several steps along the way to improve these surveys uh, in order to have a full risk mapping. And also we made sure to have a possibility to compare perception between workers and farm owners. We had to build a lot of user capacity uh, to do that, we conducted technology training, we conducted what we call social behavior change communication workshops, um, and we, we started this whole work of um, building user capacity uh, through these different workshops. We also did a lot of IT development to adapt the tool, and we developed strategies to build partnership for the future. Just a few pictures on uh, some of the activities we did right at the beginning of the project where we were collecting farmers feedback. And this was in our methodology a very important point because we made sure to co-create the tool with the users, which means going back and forth constantly to get uh, farmers adapting. It is a long process, which requires of course much more effort than um, a, tech, um, a technology provider would do, for example, by just designing a um, one-step solution. Uh, but we believe it is an ex essential point in the methodology. Just an overview on the project milestones. So we started the project in 2019. There have been two phases um, with a, a little break in between. Um, some of the main milestones at the, in 2019 were really to ensure the alignment with the international standard, uh, specifically the Sucro, uh, engage with the users, collect their feedback, uh, conduct focus group discussions, engage with farmers in Surin, Sakel, uh, Ratchaburi as well. Uh, in 2020, our main milestones were to integrate all these user feedback into the application. And by this, we mean a lot of IT development there and improvement also on all the social and technology adoption surveys to make sure that we collected the right uh, type of data that could then be interpreted. Um, so we conducted these surveys, we did a lot of uh, analysis, we also did a lot of field trips and workshops, we recorded some podcasts for farmers' engagement, and we uh, arrive at the end of our project now where we are communicating all the results and we really want to build the next steps uh, for tomorrow. Some 
pictures about uh, some stakeholders engagement we did at the beginning also. So this was one of the main uh, starting point of the project to make sure that we agreed on the methodology we were going to use along the project with uh, the NIL staff. Um, some numbers around the stakeholders outreach. These are the core uh, users that we have constantly engaged. So 34 mill staff, 48 farm owners, and 37 farm workers. Uh, why are these numbers not that high? It's because we didn't aim at, at conducting um, only like a social survey. We really aimed at engaging these users and do a follow-up along the project. We also uh, made sure that we conducted workshops with them and gathered their feedback so it's basically like a trial uh, book that helped us to design a tool that would uh, be fit, fitted for their needs. And I'll leave it to you, maybe Namfan, to uh, talk a little bit more about some of the features that we developed. Thank you, Juliet. So in Verificate application, there is a working agreement feature which is shown in this uh, slide. In this working agreement feature, it helps support transparency and good labor practices in the Thai sugarcane industry. How do we do that? Um, in this feature, the worker and the farm owner will create and validate their working contract. And in this feature, we have list of questions, which is very short and easy to answer with a lot of drop down drop down question, which is making it easy for user to use because some of the user are not familiar with the application. So making and making something that easy for user is very important for us. And you can go to the next slide. And another feature that we have in Verificate is social risk assessment. And in this social risk assessment, we ask some question and in this question, we aim to help improve and understand better about their labor practices on the ground. Some question around labor rights, workplace, and how they are hiring their worker. And at the end of the survey question, there are a list of scenario, which is very easy in the farmer language that they would be able to understand well, and as well as um, the end of the scenario, as well as the scenario, we also have the list of the organization that the user can reach out to 24 seven in case that they found themselves through the survey that they are under the scenario that is being treated unfairly. Yes, we can go to the next slide. Um, part of the project that we add in this project is the social and behavioral communication chain, which is in short SBCC. What is SBCC? SBCC is an activity that we wanted to promote improvement of the knowledge and attitude around working agreement, good practices, minimum wage, health and safety, and other human rights topics under the 12 social category that we uh, extract from the standard, as well as the understanding of why technology is very important for user to use and how we can improve the using uh, user adaptation of technology. So we conduct a total of four SBCC, both online and on-site. And in this picture on the, on the right, uh, we had the on-site SBCC with farm owner in Surin, which is the province, the border of Thailand and Cambodia. And in the corner left, you will see that we have an SBCC activity together with the permanent migrant worker in the sugarcane field in Sakgel, which is uh, the um, they are the family that live in Thailand and work in the Thailand sugarcane farm. Um, in next slide, uh, it is the SBCC that we conducted online together with the farm worker in Surin. And, and next, I am giving the floor to Jumi to discuss more about the fighting and 
how we discover those findings. Thank you, Pinopon. Okay, so we go to our finding. I will explain that how we do it. So we build our own algorithm by using the R open software. Um, the first thing that we do is define the condition for the code color. This one, they will give you a little bit of simple example because with the raw data, it's getting more complex. Uh, we designed the survey based on the social categories and the bond to code standard. With this one, if you want to look in the social categories of fair recruitment, then you decide the questions that you're going to ask the worker that do you have working agreement? And then you define the condition that we will show green tab if the answer that they have the written agreement. And we will show the orange tab if they answer that, okay, they have the oral agreement or other type of agreement or the NA is that mean that no one respond to, to these questions. The orange tab, it mean that we need to investigate more for these questions. And for the red tab, it will show when they answer that there's no contract between them. After that, we conduct a social survey with the uh, target group. Uh, uh, can you go back to the uh, previous slide, please? The, the, pre the previous slide. Uh, before then? Yes, okay. The working agreement that we asked, um, they show that 33% of them have no working agreement. So this is how our algorithm works. Okay, for the next slide, this is the overall of the uh, interpretational table that we found. This is the 12 social categories. And um, this is the answer that we got from the farm owners and the farm workers. With this method, it gives us the possibility to prioritize and try and collect the data, sort out more information from the initial data. And also we can use this method with the scale data, not only with the small data. With the finding that uh, we found, we have the main risk that we identifying, which is here. Uh, the first one is health and safety. We found that the workers are not provided the gloves and boots by the farm owner. And when they have to work with the work involved with the chemical, they usually don't put the safety equipment on their own. With the fair remuneration, most of them experience receive the money less than the minimum wage, and there is no overtime payment for them. And most of them also receive the advance payment before they come to work in the field. And with the child labor, uh, most of them also bring their kids to stay with them in the farm during their work also. So with the forced labor that there is no working contract between the farm workers and the farm owners. And uh, if the worker is a migrant worker, usually they give that document with, to the farm owner to keep it. And yeah, they receive the advance payment in the price of the game. Uh, the last one is grievance mechanism is still in existence as there is no channel for the workers to send the, the to, or to complain the problem like when they're facing. Uh, to confirm for all those survey analysis, we did do the field visit. And additionally, we also find more interesting information, which uh, my colleagues, Pime, will explain more go in, and go in detail about this. I give the floor to Pime. Thank you, Jimmy. In general, our field trip, we found many different men in migrant workers. Most of them did have a working contract. We found some workers did not get the payment, uh, or uh, the minimum did not give to them. Uh, in the past, around uh, 40,000 baht, uh, 40,000 baht, and the work. They don't know who to ask for help. You can see the uh, picture website, the two men raising the uh, husband and wife, they don't receive the money from the farm owners. And also what they are doing, they have to, to change the farm to work. Also for them, they don't have the OT because they just want to finish their work with their uh, at one money. 
uh, they will work as much as possible. They didn't care also about uh, uh, our, our working per days. And the Thai worker, they receive at one money from the farm owner uh, outside of any sided agreement every year. It's like uh, when they finish the work this year, they have to ask at one money for next year. They are doing like this from their young girl until now around uh, more than 40 years already. And also many of worker families have been working in the sugarcane industry for a very long time because their parents cut the cane before. And when they grow up, they cut the cane the same as their parents. For the children at the farm, uh, some family, they have to bring the children to stay in the farm because there is no one to take care of the children they are working uh, and also they uh, didn't go to school and some family if they have two children uh, the oldest kid will take care of the uh, small ones uh, for housing, uh, uh, for living connection, we found many farms. Can, uh, the, the toilet is not enough for everyone. They have to take a shower in uh, open the area. And the problem is men and women from different families uh, uh, showering together in the open area. And for food, I uh, see from the okay. Okay, thank you, Juliet. Here you can, can see from the picture or uh, they uh, just uh, take the vegetable nearby their house to cooking because they, are, they cannot access to the electric. And when uh, they want to have like chicken for or fresh food, they have to buy the ice and put in the box to keep their food for, for their cooking. Yeah, thank you. All right. So I'm sure you guys have a lot of questions. We will have a session for questions later. But let's discuss further on the challenges and how we overcome those challenges throughout the two phases of our project. So the challenges that we found, uh, the first one is, is it was difficult to have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with the migrant worker. Um, so whether it was in the sugar cane. Um, so we have, to, we have to reach out to our partner to be able to have a few tips or have a conversation with people in the, in the field around their working condition, especially with the migrants. And when we, when we go there on the field, some migrants are not familiar speaking in Thai with us, so uh, we have to bring the translator as well as uh, in the future, we would have to bring the information chart in their languages. And uh, um, for the application as well, uh, we need to add the in our application. Um, and another challenge is uh, a lot of time, not just the migrant, the Thai worker as well. They are living in the poor living condition, but they are not aware how uh, their poor living condition is. When we had a survey with them or an in online interview with them, uh, we asked if you were happy with your work, how is the uh, housing? Everyone said it's great. But when we uh, go on a field trip, having an SBCC with them, to overcome how to understand better what it is, we learned that there are a lot of things that needed to be improved. Um, and uh, 
So in the future, we, over, we have to overcome this by having the SBCC. And the SBCC activity is still our very first step that we do within the two-phase project. Um, there are still so much more that we needed to do um, because uh, making change in the, in, in the uh, migrant and the farm farmer is, is still a lot more to do to improve this awareness. Um, and then the fourth challenge is the technology adoption. Um, we overcome it by uh, uh, requiring the tool for co-creation. So we, we, we bring the tool for them to use and try because some of the worker and the farm owner are not owning their uh, smartphone or sometimes one smartphone are used for the whole family. Um, and as well as uh, we do the SBCC for the adoption of the technology. Um, and then the ch another challenges is the data privacy concern. The user are concerned about the information that they input. Where is it going? How, who is keeping it? Um, would uh, people know too much about their financial or something like that. So um, in the to overcome this, we add a statement that explain what verificate is and how their data is being protected. So whenever people log into the application, they would see this and see this statement and then they would click agree, agree on this great agreement uh, statement so to say that they all read it and understand it. And we made it short so that it will not be too, too long for them to read. So the next thing is around uh, challenges that we have throughout the COVID situation. So during the COVID time, there are The Thai government are not opening the border because it, it will spread the, the COVID. So there are many procedures for them to follow through. Uh, to mitigate that, the farmer association, especially in the border province like Sakel, uh, they the farmer association push and work together with the government to put out a short time MOU for the migrant worker to come during the sugarcane harvesting season. Um, and then another big thing for the farmer that they seeing in the COVID time is the higher production costs for the farmer. Uh, for example, the fertilizer is very expensive. They say during our field trip visit, gas price is very expensive, all the weeding products. And since they don't have a lot of uh, worker, so they have to invest in the uh, machine instead of uh, hiding the labor. So to mitigate this uh, for the farmer, farm, sugarcane farmer, they, the farmer association asked the office of sugarcane board, the national sugarcane price sector to increase the price of the sugarcane when they sell the sugarcane to the mills. Um, in terms of the challenges that we find as a project, um, there are a lot of activity that was delayed because of COVID. So to mitigate this, we have done the online interview. We did the online survey as well as a lot of uh, video call outreach activity um, throughout the project with the online event, yeah. And uh, in this slide, it's just an illustration that we had an online interview with the farm owner, uh, the interview with the new staff online because of COVID, yeah.
Okay, sorry, I was struggling to unmute myself. Thank you, Namfon. Um, I don't have much time left. Uh, we are arriving at the end of the presentation. Um, I'll just add on top of uh, some of these challenges, one um, additional big challenge that we faced, and I, I'm pretty sure many people who work in, in this topic face the same as the fear of automation. Uh, so basically during the workshops that we conducted, we were surprised that all workers always say that everything was fine, that we were happy, that there were no issues, uh, which didn't really match what we found out in the social surveys. Um, when we conducted workshops specifically with migrant workers, uh, they were very quiet. They, uh, they didn't participate much. Uh, and, and basically, when we went on the field, we had all this reality check on, on you know, showing, for example, bad living conditions, uh, issues with remuneration. Um, so our feeling was really that the presence of, of certain farm owners induced a big bias in all the answers that we received from the workers and, and all their behavior and how they acted during the workshops. Um, we, we could sense that they were afraid to uh, fear their job, for example, and didn't really want to criticize a farmer in front of us, uh, obviously. Um, to us, this was a challenge, of course, uh, because we do want to reach out to workers and of course we don't want to have the risk for them to lose their job, which would be completely counterproductive. Um, so it highlights a lot the importance of you know, cross-checking data using some of these online tools that allow us to collect anonymous data, that allow us to have like a better understanding of what's going on, uh, but also doing a lot of field trips is an essential part to start building long-term trust, because what we want in VN is to um, manage to drive change without having bad consequences for these migrant workers. Um, I'll end with a few key away. Uh, this was, yeah, we discussed many things um, and I just want to make sure that we focus on the most important messages. So during this project, uh, we engaged uh, stakeholders, we engaged mill staff, we engaged farm owners, farm workers. Um, we conducted surveys uh, which had different objectives. Uh, technology adoption surveys uh, were required to assess which methodology we had to put in place uh, to bring technology to um, farmers and workers. We conducted social surveys that allowed us to do a full risk mapping of the situation um, for these users that we were engaging. How we use technology, uh, which uh, I believe was a very uh, big success in, success in the project, was to do advanced analysis of these survey results, which helped us to prioritize social risks. And why this is an important point in our project is that the methodology we use on this small amount of uh, data could actually be reproduced and we used on big amount of data. For example, um, NGOs that would have like large data set, uh, we could apply this type of algorithms to have all this priority, prioritization. Uh, we uncovered this around child labor, living conditions, grievance mechanisms, among other topics. Um, one key takeaway on this is that, yes, it is important to do these online surveys, especially with this uh, COVID situation, but it is also essential to have field trips because these social surveys and helped us to, it informed us on which area we had to dig further. And then these field trips were essential to confirm the findings, but also to uncover additional issues. We use technology to support workers uh, through some of the features that were digital working agreement, um, anonymous short social survey. I would say here, one of the key takeaways is that this is just the first step. Um, technology adoption, specifically for people who are not tech savvy, takes time. SBCC workshops are the way forward, we believe, but we need more time uh, in the future to keep engaging more workers and more users. 
we identify these key factors to ensure scalability. So one of them is the co-creation of the tool with the users. Uh, this is uh, a key message that we had at the beginning of the project and we, we, we confirmed it through, throughout the project. Uh, also the repetition of training, just one workshop is never enough to fully engage uh, workers and to really have them using the tool. We also identified that we need higher private sector engagement. Um, this is something um, that is uh, highlighted, I think, in many projects. Um, but definitely in, in our project, this is something that we identified as key, um, as well as identifying leader farmers, uh, specifically in COVID situations, where we need people on the ground who are able to support the activities if we can go on the field. Um, so yeah, basically, uh, we these are the key takeaways that we would like uh, you to remember. In terms of next steps, what we have in mind, um, well, first of all, is to engage organizations that uh, would be based in the migrant workers countries of origin, because we identify that these seasonal workers, they go back to the country, and then we just lose contact with them. So we need to have a possibility to keep contact with them. And we believe that external NGO can help us with this. Um, we believe we have to provide free uh, protective equipment. Uh, we need additional training. We need educational workshops and keep doing this work. We want to keep engaging the farmers. Um, we've started all these uh, social media engagement um, and it's like the beginning, but like, for example, we have this project of uh, having a TikTok account because in Thailand it's working well with the young farmers generation. Um, and we want to work closer with specific leader farmers. Um, we also want to explore the combination of using automatic survey phone calls in the migrant language with automatic social algorithms that we have developed during this project. Um, this is actually something we uh, already were thinking about, but we didn't have a budget to go through these automatic survey phone calls. So definitely as a next step, it would be interesting. And finally, um, well, basically, we have discovered issues right regarding living conditions and risky situations for children, and we don't want to stop now. I think the same issue for any project. Uh, we do what we can with the time we have, with the budget we have, um, and in some cases, delightful events like COVID just go in the way um, and kind of uh, go in the way of our plans. Right. Uh, so we have a feeling that raising awareness is just not enough. It can even be counterproductive if we cannot provide the proper support to follow up on the issues. So we have started to establish connections um, that would serve for a next phase, uh, but definitely we need additional private sector engagement, additional time and budget if we want to drive this long term impact. And with this, I will move to the questions and answers session. So um, how are we going to do this? I think we're not that many in the call. So maybe if you have a question, you can uh, unmute yourself and, and just ask for your question. Uh, alternatively, you can also write it in the chat. Hi, um, thank you so much for your informative and really interesting presentation. You you touched on some of this um, already, but I was wondering how you kind of overcame your uh, selection bias in terms of um, obviously, as you mentioned, you know, the using the online surveys is a really um, innovative tool, but it does limit you to, to people who are literate, for example, um, and kind of how you might overcome that in the future. Yeah, so I think the, the well, what, the first important thing is that uh, the surveys we conducted according to the number of people who answered it cannot be, uh, the information cannot be used as a general overview of the sugarcane Thai industry. This is uh, not the objective because they are bigger organizations that, uh, that can do this, this kind of uh, research. Um, I would say that the main objective was to assess the situation for the users that we engage. Uh, we believe that we have covered different case studies that would cover basically uh, some farmers and workers that are within uh, what I would call a clean supply chain, which is TRR uh, supply chain. Uh, why? Because TRR meal is already doing a lot of work on uh, 
European in their supply chain. And you can, you can see from the result that uh, farmers within their supply chain are, are indeed, uh, you know, uh, showing that the, the main issues pointed out are not completely red, I would say. Um, but we also discovered that whenever we reach out to certain, to other farmers that are not in these what I would call clean supply chain, we really assess that uh, there are huge issues. And, and for us, it's, it's, it's complicated because in the end, it, we kind of um, achieve the conclusion that in the supply chains where buyers or mills are willing to do efforts, you all the supply chains, that's where you find all these issues. Now, the buyers of the meals are not willing to do the effort in this supply chain. So what, what, what can we do? Um, and basically what, what comes out of it is that maybe buyers should work together to tackle the issues in the whole um, industry and not only in their own supply chain. Thank you so much. Okay, I will read the question from uh, Paul Buckley. So thank you for so much, very much for the presentation. Could you give us any thoughts on how representative you think the symbol might be? I understand it's not intended to be representative, but would you anticipate being able to, or having been able to, which rules in more precarious exploitative situations? If not, do you think you would be able to do this with these tools? So uh, one of the things we did uh, at the end of the project was to actually uh, conduct one-on-one -on -one meetings with specific NGO um, and specific actors uh, that are working uh, in, the, in, the, in the sector of counter-trafficking in person, the migrant workers. Um, and we wanted to compare the results, the findings that we had in our project with their own findings, specifically interesting whenever they were working with huge samples. Um, and it was very interesting to see actually that we found out many things that were similar. Um, even if our numbers are very small, uh, some of the issues we uncovered really matched uh, bigger, bigger, I would say, surveys and, and bigger actions that were taken by, by these bigger uh, organizations. So I, I believe that um, whenever you manage to sample a little, I mean, statistically speaking, it's not significant, but Maybe we got lucky, but I think we have actually a pretty good representation of what's happening in the Taishuken industry. Um, and these tools that we are using, uh, if, if we had access to a bigger number of data, and by this I mean we have a methodology to reach out to migrant workers, we just uh, maybe don't have the staff, <laughs> enough staff uh, to reach out to as many people as we want. But if we had access to this data for partnerships, for example, then we could do all these analyses on a bigger scale. And the algorithms, uh, we, they are pretty solid. We've been working on them uh, over and over and consulting with experts in social um, areas. Thank you for a very insightful presentation. Did you come across any good practice in some farms compared to others? And what facilitated better social environmental practices? Um, I, I can get yes. this one. Yes. Oh, sorry. Go, go ahead. <laughs> um, for, for the uh, better socio environmental practices, uh, one of the things that the, the uh, Thailand government are doing is the giving the incentive money to the farmer not to burn the sugar cane before they cutting it. In the past, like five years ago, the, they had to burn the sugar cane because it's easier to cut. And then it will be a shorter time because it's easier, it will finish faster. Um, however, it's caused a lot of problem under the PM 2.5. So um, the government have given the incentive money for, for the farm that doing the not burning the sugar cane, cutting the fresh sugar cane, like about 120 per ton. So that have been very, very uh, improving the practices of the sugar cane burning. So not a lot of burning anymore. Um, another thing that we found is um, one of the farm owner that we met in um, in during the field trip when we have an interview and with the farm worker, um, he he do not use 
uh, harvesting machine, but he always used the um, worker to cut his sugarcane by hand. And he was saying that to do this, it's very helpful for the root of his sugarcane. So instead of uh, changing his practices into harvesting through the har big harvesting machine, he always rely on the worker to work in his sugarcane farm. So uh, yeah, go ahead, Julia, if you have anything else to add or to me and Pime as well. That's all from my side. Thank you, Namfon. Maybe I have just one small thing to add, which is uh, more related to the social practices. Um, one of the uh, other thing we, we really felt is that sometimes we faced farm owners that were having social practices that uh, were not okay and that we would flag as orange, um, but they were unaware of it. And it, it, it didn't come from a bad place at all. Um, so this is also something that's interesting, how, uh, you know, it's sometimes it's a matter of perspective and, and it's not all black and white. So definitely on, on the whole social topics, uh, we believe that, yeah, uh, there's, there's a lack of awareness um, and sometimes workers are just not aware of their rights. But at the same time, and this is a discussion um, Megan uh, was having with us like just yesterday, uh, sometimes we have to be careful because if we raise awareness for workers and tell them, oh, these are your rights, but then they get frustrated if they can't have the power to get these rights, right? So, so we need to be sure that at the same time as we raise awareness, we provide proper support to drive this change. Um, um, Namfan, I think uh, you're best suited for the next, qu next question also. How do you engage with farm owners and share findings with them? Um, uh, so, Thanks to the partnership that we have done with uh, the meal. So the meal was giving us the list of the farm owner that they wanted to train them to be able to make readiness for the one sucrose certification. Um, and at the time we engaged the farmer through our partnership with other NGO. Um, as well as the, um, the experience of the leader partner that we have existed so far in the past. So uh, from, so those are how, those are the, the process and procedure that how we engage with the farmer. If no further questions, um, I will move to the next phase and we will try to fit it in 10 minutes max. Um, and also please don't hesitate if you have any additional questions to uh, send it by email afterwards, of course. Okay, so this is just a little session where we wanted to have a little interaction. Um, you will find, you, you have found, I think in the email we sent uh, the link to a Jamboard uh, which allow which will allow us to uh, interact. So we just have uh, this slide where we would like you to add uh, some comments. Um, if you don't feel comfortable using the Jamboard, you can also just unmute yourself and, and just uh, speak freely. Uh, otherwise, you have this little text box here. Uh, you can click and you can just write uh, here some, some of the, the thoughts. So we have basically two small questions. Uh, the first is, uh, did you face any similar outcomes in your own projects? Because we were focusing specifically on the Thai sugarcane industry. For us, it would be very interesting to know um, if among the audience, some people have faced similar outcomes in maybe in other industries. Um, and maybe also, did you face any additional challenges? For us, it was very hard to adapt with the COVID situation. Um, and we would like to know in your own projects um, if you had like, uh, you know, these type of challenges or additional challenges that the one we exposed me. And don't hesitate to unmute yourself if, if you'd rather uh, say it out loud. And maybe Namfan, can you also send in the chat the link just in case uh, so it's easier for people to access? Oh, perfect. Thank you, Jeremy.
you also have uh, on the next slides uh, some place where you can add your contact details. Uh, one of the things we would like uh, to do after this webinar is to connect with the different people who participated um, and exchange more and keep the contact on what can be done next. Uh, because we, as, as I was stating in the presentation, uh, and uncovering all the issues, and, and also because we had, I mean, we actually met these migrant workers and the farmers, um, made us really want to keep the work with them. And, and for this, we need additional partners because uh, driving change in these sectors cannot be done alone. That's uh, one also key takeaway. Okay, thank you, Lucy. Yeah, so someone is writing, but the remote activities is not as effective. Um, I, I really have to agree on this. Uh, I would say that we, uh, we, we had high hopes at the beginning of the project that we could do everything online as well, that it would still work as long as we had someone on the ground. Uh, but it was actually pretty complicated, like some connection issues, uh, but also the attention span is much shorter whenever we do things online. Um, we definitely uh, discovered that it helps when we have someone uh, who lives in the village, for example, and who has his own computer and who can animate a little bit and having all the farmers um, sitting around him so that they can discuss um, instead of having only like a, a remote call. So we have another question. How do you incentivize or encourage other farmers to work with you in the future? So I would say that one, uh, one of the main engagement strategies that we had adopted until now was to uh, use our tool, which can uh, support farmers to achieve one super certification as an incentive. So the social aspect was added a bit later. Initially, we really had all this environmental uh, metrics verification in the tool. Um, therefore, we, we had this kind of like uh, top-down approach where the mills want the farms to get certified and therefore they, they are giving the push here to encourage the farmers to work with us and to use the application uh, to support uh, achieving this certification. Um, but definitely in terms of social uh, risk assessment, we uncovered that when we go only for the meals, we don't have access to the same type of information uh, because most of the time we access only farmers that are already doing good. Uh, so which is why basically what we did as a second part of the project was to try a bottom up approach where um, going through farmers association, but basically working in the villages um, and using this like, um, and, uh, so I don't know in English, but basically the network. So, you know, you know one farmer and you just ask him, can you just um, give information or verify it to other friends? And then it's like a snowball effect, but it does take time uh, to, to get this snowball effect working. And in terms of incentivization for the future, what we want to do is see to really build these partnerships where we could have like, for example, free protective equipment that would be provided to all the participants. Um, it can be free, um, free seats. It can be uh, access to, uh, you know, short shortcut whenever they would go to the meal, for example. This is something that we're pretty, pretty well. Uh, for, for workers it's, and farm owners, it's important to be able to um, give the, the raw sugarcane to the meal as soon as possible and not wait in the line because the sugarcane content decreases with time, therefore they can lose money. So these are the little tricks uh, that we're trying out. Some work, some don't work. And, and to be honest, it's, a, it's really a back and forth process where we're still learning um, and which is why it's taking time. Crossing border problem for migrant during COVID time. Yes, definitely. Okay, don't hesitate, please. Yeah, perfect. People are putting their contact details. Amazing. You have other slides here if you want to add your contact details. Um, and we will send uh, an email at the at, um, so at the end of the week just to summarize a little bit the findings, uh, but also put again the link of this jamboard so that you can also connect with people who are part of this webinar. And I will ask everyone.
one as a last little action uh, to put your camera on because um, we would like to take a little picture. So if everyone can put the camera on, we will take a screenshot. Okay, everyone smile. And fun, can you also take some screenshot just in case I'm messing up? <laughs> Okay, with these uh, last questions, um, I would like to thank everyone for participating in, in this webinar. Um, as said previously, please do not hesitate uh, to reach out to us for any question or to uh, Megan or to Elizabeth. Uh, we are very pleased uh, to have everyone on board today and to be able to share our findings in uh, this LTP project. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Have a good rest of your day.